today we will be discussing about the arguments for a materialistic theory of mind. But before that, as we have been discussing about the arguments against materialism and arguing in favor of uh, dualism, let us see how far these arguments sustain uh, in philosophical discourses. These arguments as you know are, are advocated from the point of view of religion, from the point of view of introspection as one of the essential feature of mind, from the point of view of parapsychology. All these arguments are uh, discussed in the last class. Now, today we will be talking about the difficulties in retaining these arguments, particularly when we talk about introspection as a kind of a mechanism to look into the inner experiences of uh, uh, the mind or the mental life of human beings or any other creatures, we find that it is very difficult to have you know, this argument of uh, from the point of view of introspection. Now, the question arises is here, does inner observation reveal things, reveal the reality? Because when we talk about sight, hearing, touch, etcetera, we say that let us talk about the you know, a citation of the color of an apple. Now, the red surface of apple does not look like the matrix of molecules reflecting photons at a certain critical wavelengths. So, this is what is the language of science I was talking about. Now, materialism would uh, talk about the existence of reality, the existence of the physical phenomena from the point of view of the scientific understanding of uh, the reality, the scientific understanding of the physical phenomena. Now, when they would be explaining us what is color and how does a, a red apple look like. Now, if that is the question, then they would have a certain explanation like this that now there are certain molecules which are reflecting photons at a certain critical wavelength. So, the, there is a electrochemical state in the neural network. So, the, the very sensation of having a color will refer to what kind of neural processes are involved, what kind of chemical secretions are happening, what kind of you know the electromagnetic waves are seen in the case of such a sensation of color or etcetera. So, introspection will not really refer to the existence of such uh, things. Introspection will only talk about how do an individual feel like having that experience, whether it is an experience of pain, whether it is an experience of uh, happiness, whether it is an experience of color. So, the language of science and the language of so, philosophy completely differs in the sense that philosophical description does not strictly hold on to the language of science. Philosophy tries to explicate the reality which is embedded in the mental life. So, for example, that the very fact that I am very fascinated and being attracted towards this red object called apple is my personal feeling towards that object. I am expressing the per my personal feeling towards an, towards an object. So, that is, is undeniable. It is not that science is wrong. It is not that the, the kind of explanation science provides to us is completely meaningless. No, philosophers would not argue from that point of view. Philosopher would argue that that let us accept science, let us accept the propositions of science and also not to deny the fact that such a reality exists. The experiences are very unique kind of 
phenomenon and that exist in uh, reality and particularly when we talk about the human mind and therefore, the argument of irreducibility is, uh, is again and again comes back to the discourse of philosophy of mind, whether mind can be completely explained by the scientific uh, terms, is the language of science is sufficient enough to talk about uh, human mind. So, so, there are some challenges and there are some challengeable questions which are often advocated by philosophers of mind who accept that there is something called mind and maybe they are dualist, maybe some of them are idealist who would like to speak from the point of view of religion. I mean idealist would probably talk about the reality and this reality exists depending on the kind of perception that we have and that will be a kind of a philosophical thesis which a subjective idealist would talk about. That is a dangerous thesis in fact, because it, it is dangerous in the sense that a subjective idealist would say that my ideas are all only real, reality that is that is dependent on my idea or constructed by um, my mind is only real. So, whatever I am representing is only real. So, that kind of assertions are not philosophically correct. So, philosophers would delve into the issues which are raised by science and scientific community which pursue the research in, in this particular area called the mind or the mental. So, the argument of irreducibility would is also being challenged. Uh, it is being challenged, uh, let us say reason is not central to human thinking, because when you talk about mathematical reasoning, mathematical reasoning are sometimes created, the very sophisticated robot will create you know, solution to certain mathematical problems, probably which a kind of a, a naive mind will not able to comprehend the problems, may not be able to imagine that you know, such an things can be solved, but computer can do that and a very sophisticated artificially made robot can solve the problem. So, that is where we can imagine a case where mathematical reasoning is being created by and it is created by human beings of course, but it is created and being put in, in the machine and machine can operate and demonstrate that you know machine is capable of you know solving the problem. So, that is what is important, it is does not matter who is creating it, it matters how it is being solved. Now, the very fact that it is being solved by a particular robot in a, in a particular way or by following a kind of a multiple ways you know, is something very relevant to the philosophical community. The community who argues for the dualistic thesis of mind, because such a challenge can be very dangerous to the dualistic thesis, because reasoning is no more any kind of an essential property of human mind, reasoning is rather can be artificially made. No? The very fact that reasoning is a kind of a faculty, faculty for articulating judgment, for articulating decisions, articulating actions etcetera is, is artificially um, or can be artificially made is something very significant to uh, us. Now, therefore, a computational mechanism uh, displays general principle of mathematical reasoning is something very significant. Now, let us talk about the argument from language. Now, language as we mentioned uh, earlier that it is only a human phenomenon, human beings do have language 
in the sense that it is a full fledged you know sense in which human languages are are capable of analyzing meaning they are capable of communicating to uh, the others interpreting others actions animals do produce sounds animals do communicate you know among themselves birds do make sounds but what is important in the case of human sound making is a, is a typical way in which humans produce sound human beings talk human beings articulate their thoughts they represent their thoughts now this idea of representation and communication are central to human uh, linguistic life human beings live a kind of a full fledged linguistic life and from the point of view of that life that forms of life we are able to interpret others form of life so for, for example the form of life of animals birds uh, insects all their behaviors are interpreted from the kind of uh, linguistic categories that we have with us in our form of life that is the human form of life so is language an essential aspect which can explain human behavior completely probably yes but what is important here is that is language intrinsic to life is language essentially embedded in life is being questioned by you know the philosophers who definitely like the dualistic theory of mind they question that language can be artificially met like reason is artificially formed similarly we can form language in a, in a artificial way and as you know that computational mechanism that we are talking about is fully developed by developing a kind of an artificial language java photons c++ all these things that you are learning are nothing but artificial language so an artificial language can also be made and it can run in the machine and perform certain linguistic activities is something very significant to to us because if language can be artificially made then we will have linguistic beings probably those beings are also artificial beings so there is nothing specific about human life per se uh, which will uh, suggest that human beings are linguistic beings rather there are other beings who have this uh, and therefore they are able to uh, know comprehend certain things they have certain extraordinary power of comprehending and solving the problems so a being is empowered or can be empowered by you know by language and this language can be artificially met so there is nothing and therefore you know specific about language so the it, it is only a matter of degree it is only a matter of complexity that is involved here so language use is can can also be uh, there in the case of a physical systems so like robots have a language computer or, or computational processes are performed by using artificial language now here is an argument which creates no problem for materialism or materialistic theory of mind or a scientific theory of mind so that is what is you know the non dualist would argue about the non dualist who are in fact non idealist in fact they are realist or you can say that they are physicalist who say that matter only is real okay so we will have some discussion on materialism today but what is important is to look at this arguments the arguments from the point of view of introspection argument against this irreducibility thesis particularly with reference to reason and language and then we'll find that regarding the intrinsic qualities of 
sensations that you uh, know there is an active research programs which are going on in, in the scientific world is something very significant and it, it is not just rhetoric there is no rhetoric possible science does not speak uh, its language as philosophers of course speak so there is no rhetoric uh, involved in it rather what is important for the, the scientific community who are involved in the research activities of of mind they are in fact uh, interested to explain the mystery about the mind that is what is uh, interesting to them now we would uh, look at the notion of parapsychology whether parapsychology is a valid theory at all for example parapsychology would have some kind of mystery in it when we talk about telepathy we do have you no know, the sense of uh, a feeling that yes my mother is remembering me or this is what he must be thinking right now and if you call him you will find out yes exactly he is thinking that if parapsychology is a successful theory of mind then how far it is uh, scientific in the sense that how far it is rational to be engaged in such kind of a discourse some philosophers of mind would also find that when we talk about telepathy we will also find that there is some kind of a radiation you now electromagnetic wave radiation happening at the speed of light now that is very you know amazing amazing evidences that we find in the case of scientific explanations so we have have effects and when we say that somebody else is you know remembering me or thinking about me probably his mind is acting like an as a receiver okay or, or a transmitter who is a transmitting one mind transmitting thought another mind trying to capture that wavelength and you know so in, in that sense there is a kind of a connection established through this wavelength so the electromagnetic wavelength that happens when we start thinking means uh, we are not a sleeping mind we are actively engaged in thinking so that is what uh, when we we think and this wavelength is being created the effect of this wavelength is also being felt okay and what matters is probably the intensity of thinking if the intensity of thinking is uh, more probably the wavelength is more and the wavelength is effective so from that point of view we cannot really deny the kind of you no know, wavelength the electromagnetic wavelength that radiates that cannot be uh, deniable there may be somebody who is thinking what i am thinking right now that is, that is possible that is unobservable but what is observable is that there is a magnetic wave being received the, by an individual that is what is significant you can call it telepathy or you can call it something else so science would uh, in fact go with this kind of evidences because science should try to prove things to us that yes this is what is happening in the mind this is what is happening in the mind when we are contemplating on telepathy so what we call telepathy or what a religious person will talk about telepathy or a parapsychologist will talk about telepathy the neuroscientist would say that no there is a electromagnetic wave radiation happening and what matters most to us is the intensity of uh, this uh, wave how it is being received by the other mind the mind is not only creating the wave the mind is, mind also act acts as a as a receiver and that is you know a kind of a significant evidence to explain that telepathy is not a mystery rather telepathy if telepathy happens then it happens in a more scientific uh, way so th with this uh, few uh, arguments 
we would uh, conclude that there are points of views which does not really strengthen the arguments that are put forward by the dualist. The dualistic conception of mind cannot hold on to the arguments of introspection, cannot hold on to the argument of uh, language or reason and cannot hold on to the evidences that are given by the parapsychologist or the religious uh, people. So, the dualistic uh, theory must come up with a new kind of language, new vocabulary and a new theory that would strongly put forth their case. Okay. So, let us conclude that, uh, that mind can be explained by science more significantly than whatever we understand from these arguments that are given by dualists. So, the scientific notion of mind is uh, in effect would help us to locate what are the physical operations, what are the uh, no, neural functions that are hap um, happening inside the brain, because we are almost sure in 21st century that it is the brain which is which controls all our voluntary actions. It is the brain which, which is responsible for our experiences, feelings, sensations, etcetera, etcetera. Now, if that is true, let us see how far the brain mind dichotomy is resolved. Now, from, uh, from this I would like to discuss on materialism. Before talking about uh, materialism, I would rather try to understand the arguments against dualism and conclude that materialist methodology is somehow very close to close to the scientific understanding of mind and what matters for the materialistic theory of mind is the physical existence of the matter and the properties that this material body uh, have. So, and how simply these properties can be explained. So, simplicity is retained okay, and the arguments are ought to be simple as Occam Schrager tells us that in order to explain mind, we need not exaggerate the mind. Probably the kind of argument which uh, uh, Churchland is uh, mentioning is something try to exaggerate the notion of mind. The, the kind of theorization which uh, if these arguments are valid, the kind of theorization that is made is, is more complex. So, what is important for us and what we can achieve here is this that if you adhere to the argument of simplicity okay, and science particularly aims at this notion of simplicity that it tries to clarify things, it, it tries to clarify the more complex phenomenon and try to show us that yes this is how things can be uh, explained and these are with reference to some evidences. So, that is what is uh, you know very significant about uh, the scientific understanding of mind. So, the explanatory devices that are available to us is uh, you know particularly with reference to the materialistic theory of mind, we will talk about the neuroscience and that fulfills the demand of simplicity. So, the existing microstructure and the causal relationship that the brain mechanism holds with the bodily organism is something very significant. So, uh, and that is true when we talk about uh, pain and pain behavior and uh, the eradication of pain. So, the, the entire uh, brain processes, the entire uh, neurological uh, processes in the brain uh, not only control our 
behavior, but also uh, are fairly responsible for making voluntary actions and that is what uh, the materialistic theory of mind would talk about. So, the brain is the center of all this you know uh, the materialistic theory. So, what you really talk about is say in the case of a trauma or traumatic experiences or in the case of any other experiences, how do we recognize that experience? That is important. Now, recognition through neural devices, uh, linguistic ability and learning, now, all these are important factors. How do we learn things? Okay, what is the mechanism of learning and how do we express those ideas? These are the things which are very important for us. And so, physical, chemical and electrical properties are necessary to formulate physical laws. It is through, you know, through the law, we can explain the behaviors, we can predict the behaviors of human beings. So, laws are important in scientific uh, world. So, uh, it is with the help of law, we explain things. So, explanation of mind depends on how the laws are formulated and how these laws, let us talk about mental laws perform their activities. So, that is important. So, laws are based on evidences, facts okay. and it is through those observable facts of the those properties, physical, chemical and electrical properties of the brain will give us or in fact will explain what is the notion of mind we have. Now, with this understanding of, uh, of the notion of mind let us go back to the kind of argument which were advocated by Gilbert Ryle. Now, I mentioned uh, that Gilbert Ryle is, uh, is giving a kind of a behavioristic interpretation of the mind. Now, there are various schools of materialism, behaviorism is one of them. The question that is that is put to us is this, is Ryle a behaviorist? Now, what is behaviorism? Behaviorism tells us that there is nothing called mind, rather mind can be known with the help of behaviors is as simple as this. Behaviors are observable phenomena and by observing these behaviors, the patterns in which a particular individual behave or a particular group behave or a particular community behaves, we can formulate certain laws. And with the help of laws, as I said earlier, we can explain their mind, we can predict their mind, etcetera. Now, when Ryle says that Descartes' concept of mind is like a ghost in the machine, when Ryle says that Descartes is committing a kind of a mistake, which can be called category mistake, because mind and body are not categorically two independent entities, rather what is significant and available to our observation is our behaviors, how does an individual behave in the world or how does an individual behave when he is interacting with the world. So, behaviors are significant and behaviors, if behaviors are taken into account, then it will deny that there is something called a hidden mind that controls all our voluntary actions and behaviors. So, Ryle is in fact denying that, but is Ryle a behaviorist? The way probably W. B. Watson, uh, P. F. Skinner conceptualized the notion of behaviorism. As, a, as, a, as an experimental science. Now, 
today. Let us briefly look at what is the Rayleian behaviorism all about? What are the, the philosophical presuppositions behaviorists maintain when they advocate uh, this thesis that behaviors reveal the mind? So, uh, let us look at uh, this. There are one point which is very clear to us behaviorism deny dualism. So, philosophical behaviorism or logical behaviorism which Riley is advocating certainly against this idea that mind is a substance. Riley rejects this thesis that mind is a substance and um, what is important for uh, Ryle is that how an individual interact with the world. Philosophical behaviorism claims that any sentence about the mental state can be paraphrased without loss of meaning. Let us understand this concept of meaning you now into a long and complex sentence about what observable behaviors would result if the person in question were in this that or the other observable circumstances. This is how you know Churchland would describe the concept of philosophical behaviorism. This is with reference to Churchland's book as I mentioned. The title of the book is Matter and Consciousness published in 1984 and the revised edition came out in 1988. Please refer to this text. Now, this gives a contemporary introduction to the philosophy of mind, the problems about the philosophy of mind and Churchland finds that behaviorism, the philosophical behaviorism is, is a problem. Philosophical behaviorism is also argued or advocated by Putnam, uh, Hilary Putnam in his essay, The Brain and the Behavior. So, I would like to uh, talk about particularly what is the philosophical presuppositions, what is the uh, background on which philosophical behaviorism or logical behaviorism is argued. Now, as I mentioned that they uh, are talking about the meaning of the concept of mind, what does mind really mean to us. Is this meaning observable? Does the meaning, the, the kind of terms, the, the vocabularies that are used, the expressions that are used will designate to something observable is a question. And particularly, this has been argued under the influence of logical positivism. So, Ryle or the Rileans who reject the dualistic thesis of mind, they were under the influence of logical positivists. Now, according to logical positivists, what is real is observable, what is meaningful is observable. If something is meaningful, if an expression is meaningful, then it must exist in reality. So, the verificationist notion of meaning as it has been argued by some of the logical positivists particularly as a Ayer, Rudolf Karnov, not a Sleek and early Wittgenstein to some extent. It has been the logical positivists, they hold on to the thesis that observable phenomena are only real and the kind of language which philosophers speak or the way philosophers theorize things whether it is about the mind or anything else, it must correspond to the reality. And when they say this, they say that 
philosophical problems arise, because there is some kind of a linguistic and conceptual confusion. And once this conceptual confusion are dissolved through analysis, then the problem is resolved. So, a philosophical problem arises because of the use of language, the vocabulary as Sir points out, okay, as Ryle also points out. Descartes dualism is, is problematic, because the kind of vocabulary that is used by Descartes. So, all the time they are referring to language. So, philosophical problems are problems of language, the kind of language that has been used to theorize mind. So, logically positivist as you all know reject metaphysics. According to them metaphysical problems are pseudo problems, metaphysical problems are not found. Idealist like Hegel would say that absolute is real and whatever is real is rational. So, the absolute can be rationally comprehended, the absolute can be rationally grasped. Now, you do not have this notion of absolute there as a as a fact. Hegel's idealism will talk about the realization of the absolute through a you know, dialectical process and that is something to do with experience and experience is something internal. So, logical positivist on the other hand would talk about the, the existence of reality corresponding to an external facts, because that which is external can be observable and can be demonstrated. So, logical positivists were very much influenced by the methodology of science. As you know science go with this idea of observation and experiment and there are many more, but these two concepts are very basic to scientific understanding. Not only conceptualize or hypothe create hypothesis, but also they try to prove the hypothesis. Now, the, the proof of the hypothesis lies there in the fact in the observation of facts. So, corresponding to the hypothesis there must must be certain facts in the world in the reality and these observable facts are to be further you know, experimented okay, following a kind of a methodology okay, and then we can suggest that yes or we can form laws and explain things. So, scientific suggestions are always for the explanation of a particular facts and they are always about demonstration that which can be demonstrated and observed from the third person's point of view. They are not about the internal experiences. So, scientists are mostly externalist. Now, the scientific explanations are always demonstrated. We can prove our scientific thesis by producing instances by producing facts which are observable and verifiable. So, logical positivist were influenced by this idea of verification and observation. Now, the verificationist principle suggests that if a statement is, is said or is articulated in a particular philosophical theory, then the statement must have 
meaning corresponding to the facts that are there in the world. So, there is there is some kind of a correspondence theory of truth advocated by the logical positivist. If it does not correspond to a fact, then it is meaningless, it is nonsensical. So, it is not that there will be always a kind of a one to one correspondence, rather a kind of a you know a set of sentences are meaningful, if and only if they in general or if they are unified must represent a fact. So, let us do not talk about this, but what is important for us to know, note here is this that philosophical behaviorism is influenced by the kind of thesis which was advocated by logical positivist. So, what is important for logical positivist is that if something is philosophically correct, if something has to be philosophically correct, then it must be verifiable and observable. That is the proposition. And the second one is that most of the philosophical problems, which are metaphysical in nature, arise due to the misuse of language. So, they are linguistic problems okay. and these linguistic problems can be you know can be dissolved by proper analysis of language and therefore, verification the theory of veri verification is notion of meaning is one of the theories of meaning that talks about truth. Okay. That if there is a proposition, then proposition must correspond to the fact and that is how it can establish the truth. Now, Ryle is talking about philosophical behaviorism or logical behaviorism, we can say that logical behaviorism would try to solve the metaphysical thesis that is been advocated by some of the philosophers of mind, particularly Descartes, Descartes metaphysical thesis that is substance dualism. And Ryle finds that philosophical problems are also problems with reference to you know, the language, the use of language and and that is particularly evident when we he talks about categories that they are due to separate categories. So, for example, uh, when we go to buy globes in winter, we do not ask the shopkeeper give me the right hand glove, give me the left hand glove, rather we ask for give me a pair of gloves. Now, such expressions are expression proper according to Ryle that there are there are, there are many uh, examples Ryle gives, but I think this is something very significant that they are together mind and body are together and what is mind is exhibited in behaviors in various forms of behaviors. Now, how this exhibition takes place and there we can relate to the behaviorist. According to Ryle, these exhibitions happens probably because there are certain mental dispositions. So, dispositions 
manifests into behaviors. Dispositions are exhibited, okay. they exhibit behaviors like say for example, a glass is brittle. Now, the brittleness is a dispositional property of the glass. Now, once it is hit by a hard object, then it breaks down. So, uh, brittleness of the glass is manifested whenever it encounters any kind of an external cause. Okay. So, there is a kind of a causal relationship, causal relationship which uh, we find when we talk about the exhibitions of behaviors, when we talk about the manifestation of behavior. So, for example, in the, in the case of the brittle, the, the hard object hitting the glass is a kind of a you know, external force that the glass encounters. Okay. Now, so uh, this external force once it you know is the reason for the manifestation of you know of breaking down the glass. So, the glass that breaks down exhibits a particular kind of behavior which is there in the glass in the form of dispositions. So, that is what is uh, Ryle's uh, ar argument about philosophical behaviorism is that there are mental dispositions and mental dispositions do cause uh, behaviors. So, with this let us conclude uh, this thesis of dualism and in our next class we will be uh, talking about the varieties of materialism including behaviorism, how experimental behaviorism started and uh, contributed a lot to uh, the discovery of the mind, to the knowledge of the mind and along with behaviorism we will be also talking about the identity theory, how mental and the physical are identical in our next class. Thank you.